Roger Robinson mentioned that one of our presenters is a colleague and friend of all of ours, uh, who has been doing enormously important work as the Vice President for National Security at the Coalition for a Prosperous America. Uh, her name is uh, Robbie Stephanie Saunders. She has, to her credit, uh, been in a number of uh, previous incarnations, very important in fashioning public policy in the national security arena, especially. She worked at the State Department for a time. She was a national security advisor to a good friend of ours, Congressman Chip Roy, and also served with uh, one of our best United States senators as an advisor to Senator Mike Lee of Utah. Uh, we've asked Robbie to bring us up to speed on some of the uh, well, sausage making, I guess one might say, the efforts inside the Congress uh, to address not only this sort of abstract proposition that uh, the pension funds of government employees, military and civilian, past and present, under the rubric of the thrift savings plan, would be sluiced in considerable measure to the Chinese Communist Party. But to put a fine point on it, that among the people whose money would be treated in that fashion, if at least they wish to be in the international fund, the I fund, uh, or perhaps they uh, uh, are now investing through the so-called mutual fund window of the thrift savings plan. Some 5,000 companies we've told uh, are what they have on offer uh, rather 5,000 funds, and no effort has been made. None. In fact, they've actually eschewed any effort to make it part of the Federal Thrift Retirement Investment Board's um, duties, responsibilities, management uh, tasks, to advise investors in the mutual fund window which mutual funds have Chinese companies in them. Indeed, there are some, I'm told, that are entirely Chinese companies in the mutual fund holdings. So Robbie is the woman of the hour as she has been very actively involved trying to help Congress tackle the fact that members of Congress's own money in their retirement funds, in the thrift savings plan, may well be going into the coffers of Chinese companies. And we're very appreciative of all the work she does. You can learn more about it, of course, at the uh, Coalition uh, for a Prosperous America. I believe it's prosperousamerica.org is the website. But she's also been a very important contributor to a uh, coalition that uh, we've been part of as well uh, under the rubric of no TSP for the CCP. And its website is no TSP for the CCP.org. Robbie, it's great to have you with us. Thank you so much for being uh, here in person. Uh, we're going to have a chance to visit with you a little bit further on the QA side, but um, the floor is yours, ma'am. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for having me, Frank. I really appreciate it and I'm delighted uh, to get to be here with you guys today and talk about this issue. And as Frank said, you know, it is truly um, the issue of the hour as, as we speak here on this webinar, Congress is undergoing debate and votes and, and consideration of legislation on whether or not to, to solve this problem and how to advance forward our hard-fought legislative efforts on this topic um, in the House of Representatives in particular. And very grateful to uh, Roger Robinson, who, as Frank said, is, is a dear friend um, and also someone who I consider to be a mentor who really taught me um, a lot about the space and how to be involved and engaged and to bridge my knowledge and care for our national security policy, um, you know, to the financial and economic policy and an old adage in Washington that I think is true and, and kind of is the crux of this entire conversation is, is the concept of, you know, follow the money. And, you know, where the money is, there is, there's the policy, you know, there is the power and so despite all of our best, you know, interests on in, uh, the defense side of things or the diplomacy side of things, frankly, nothing matters but the money. 
And if our money is going, as, as Frank and some of our other um, co-panelists you know, mentioned, to prop up the CCP, um, then we're doing something wrong. We're making our future jobs harder. And we're also, you know, harming our, our own best interests. You know, at any sporting event, you, you have to play both offense and defense, typically, generally speaking, unless you ran track and field like I did, then you just run and hope for the best. Um, but typically you play offense and defense. And when you do that, you know, you're, you're trying to score, but then there's also a portion of the game where you're trying to prevent your, your opponent from scoring. And what we have right here in Washington is a case where we are, um, you know, com- very happy to go on offense. You know, we're going to keep ratcheting up our, our military spending. We're going to continue to increase our, our defense spending, which I think the points uh, made earlier to that point of what are we spending on um, are really important. And we should talk about, you know, a whole host of other topics there. Um, but while we're ratcheting up our spending, we're we're not doing anything to go on defense against the PLA and the PL, PLA Navy. What we're doing is we're just hoping that we will somehow continue to outcompete outpace, outspend, outprocure, out-equip, out-innovate our, our adversary. And we're never pausing to change our behavior and to reorient our, our posture in terms of what resources and what things could we be taking away from our adversary. And it's not just about a potential conflict over Taiwan, although that certainly is top of mind, but it's about resilience. It's about sovereignty. It's about American capability. It's about us being able to do whatever we want that's in our national interest regardless of what the CCP does, regardless of what, uh, you know, the interests of, of China are. And it's about us not being dependent on them uh, for, for our future and us not being able to be held hostage by them as much as it is about, you know, capability gaps and you know, promoting and maintaining a free and open Indo-Pacific and the rules-based international order, or all of those things that the foreign policy, you know, community espouses. What really is the key here is can America do what America needs to do when we need to do it? for whom we want to do it without being held hostage by someone, by a government and a regime that is hostile to our to our interests and functions completely antithetical to our values and to our way of life. And that conversation and that those policy choices and those actions are not being talked about in DC. Case in point is the source savings plan, which is what our main topic is here today, where you have the federal government, as Frank explained, financing um, the, retire- the, the Chinese Communist Party through the retirement accounts of our, our federal workforce. And that includes the military, veterans, reservists, guardsmen, uh, intelligence community, members of Congress themselves, congressional staff, judiciary, branch staff, all the executive branch staff, every single person, the postal service, every single federal employee that has access uh, to the thrift savings plan as their retirement system, their you know contribution account for their retirement, their 401k plan has a TSP. And that TSP in this case is being part of the broader problem I was just speaking to, part of this idea that we're enabling our enemy and we're not going on the defense to take away those resources. So we keep funneling money through Wall Street, through pension funds, you know, through venture capital, through private equity, through all these different forms of of, of financing and economic opportunity that America has to offer. We're giving that completely to our enemy and not just, you know, the same access we give to our allies and our friends. We're actually giving them preferential treatment because we give them special carve-outs. China does not have to comply with the same securities laws that Great Britain does or that Germany does. We give China a a different standard and we let them meet a lower threshold of accountability for us to be able to go and invest in in our money in their markets, which is just crazy. And their companies that we know are building their, their aircraft carriers, their new technology, their AI, their quantum systems, their biotech advancements, their missile development, their hypersonic glide vehicles. We are financing that because we are so greedy, we being Wall Street and America writ large, to, to have access to their companies, to invest the money there, to have the hopes of doing what Will was just talking about, of you know BlackRock selling products to the Chinese people directly, having these sweetheart deals approved by the CCP. And no one is doing anything to stop it except for a few friends we have made and cultivated and developed in Congress that are hopefully going to win the day um, in the next coming days um, and and continue to to rewrite the ship and to reorient uh, our policy on our money. Because where the money is, there the rest of the policy will, will also follow, whether it's the defense, the diplomacy, the humanitarian, the foreign aid, whatever you whatever you want, whatever your priority is, all of that flows from where the money flows. So today in Congress, we have a bill 
H.R. 3455, known as the TSP Act. In the Senate, it is S-1650. It has been uh, turned into an amendment that is considered uh, right now before the House Rules Committee. Um, it is amendment number 247, offered by Congressman Waltz of Florida, Republican, Congresswoman Chrissy Houlihan of Pennsylvania, a Democrat, and also co-sponsored uh, by Congressman August Pfluger, Republican of Texas. And these three came together to put forward this amendment um, for the NDAA, the Annual National Defense Authorization Act, um, on the House floor. And right now, it seems that we might have some good luck. Um, we've gotten uh, some sign-off and support from other committees um, in the House, including the important House Oversight Committee, which has jurisdiction over the federal pension system. Um, but we are not given any sort of guarantees that our amendment will be what's called made in order, which means given the opportunity to come to the House floor to even get a vote. So we want to win on our vote. But right now, we do not even know that we get the chance to even have a vote. Half of our battles in D.C. are about the process and about the floor and having access to what goes on the House floor or the Senate floor and being given a vote. We fight over the vote as much as we fight over the content of what we should be voting on or the yes or no vote that you should be taking. And so to even get to the point of having a vote, we view as a huge win after the many years of working on this issue, as, as Roger and Frank were both discussing, you know, going back to the, the Trump administration when this issue uh, was first being debated. But this bill is so important because what it does is it sets a new standard. It says that any country that is identified by the Director of National Intelligence, in their annual threat assessment to Congress as being a threat to United States national security interests is therefore prohibited from being invested in by the TSP. So if annually the DNI is required to give this threat assessment to Congress, if a country is a threat, then there's no TSP money that can flow into that country's companies, securities, enterprises, any sort of state-owned entities or anything else that might be somehow linked to or affiliated with the government of said country of concern. Um, and this would apply to both the I fund of the TSP, which is the traditional fund of the TSP, as well as the uh, new mutual fund window, which as Frank mentioned, had these over 5,000 funds on offer. And tragically, in these 5,000 funds on offer, as of our last check, there were more China-only emerging markets funds available then there were ex-China funds available. Let me just say that again. There are 22 China-only funds on offer. Last we checked on these numbers in May. And there are only three ex-China funds on offer. That's absurd that our own government investment platform for federal workforce, you know, future retirees, is offering more China-only investment exposure than they are ex-China exposure. Not to mention the other hundreds of funds that are riddled with Chinese companies as part of a broader initiative of, uh, you know, all country world, you know, emerging markets index or something like that. You know, so there's China throughout scattered in different places, but these kind of pro-China, you know, funds outnumber ex-China funds. That is something that must be remedied. And the, the Federal Retirement Thrift Investment Board are the officials appointed to steward and to govern the thrift savings plan, the TSP. The TSP has a small staff. The FRTIB are you know, political appointees, but they have other day jobs. And then they contract out. So these contractors, they're federal contractors who are contracted fiduciaries to manage the TSP, which was said earlier, predominantly is BlackRock. They would rather American federal workers invest their money into Chinese securities than non-Chinese securities. And there's a lot of folks involved with how the mutual fund window platform became available with the management of that platform through uh, different firms, some of them well-known management consulting firms like Accenture, um, some of them smaller firms, the boutique firms that have been brought um, brought into to the, the conversation and to the process of managing this mutual fund window. The problem is that there's a complete unwillingness on their own accord for the FRTIB or the TSP to change their contract requirements, to even do something simple and basic, like a screening out or a country filter. There's very simple tools and resources that they could choose to utilize that they're not putting into place. 
And and we believe firmly, and I, I believe firmly that you know you shouldn't be investing any money in China because all companies in China, per their own national security law, national intelligence law, particular Article Seven of their national intelligence law, you know they're required to be beholden to the CCP. They're beholden to the party. And you know maybe you could invest in some Chinese you know chicken company or a coffee company or something, and it wouldn't be nefarious. But you still have questions about you know audits and and you know financial stabil- st- stability and fidelity. Um, and fiduciary, you know, basic, basic standards that need to be met to prohibit fiduciary malfeasance. But at the end of the day, you know, overall, most Chinese companies, whether you're a railroad company or a construction company, you're in a, you know, biotech company, um, you know, any, anything else can, you know, you real estate, you are somehow in, in bed with the party. And we don't want to have any part in propping up the party in that way. And so we would prefer and, and strongly recommend this country of concern model where you're excising all opportunities for the U.S. federal workforce to be supporting any adversary via any means. And up until now, there's been nothing but misstatements um, and and an intense unwillingness to cooperate put out by the FRTIB and the TSP. Um, They're spreading myths around Capitol Hill about what our legislation would do um, because they just don't want to do it. And they know that if they make these changes and these required changes to the federal pension system, that there will be an impact and it'll be an important impact. And they don't want to do anything to upset their sweetheart deals that they have going right now, that these fiduciaries, particularly BlackRock, have going um, with, with the, you know, the leadership of the CCP and their opportunities for economic access um, in China. And so we, as much as you can, you know, we would welcome your support, um, you know, pushing your congressmen and your senators to uh, have them, you know, co-sponsor S-1650 HR 3455 or that amendment uh, version right now, which is uh, House Rules Committee Amendment number 247 to the NDAA. Um, and with that, I can pause there and i um, happy to, you know, take some questions from you, Frank. To talk a little bit more about both where we are and where we must go from here, I, I'm delighted to have a chance to visit uh, in a solo performance uh, now uh, with Robbie about Several of the things that our, our presenters, including you yourself, Ravi, have uh, have talked about. Let me start by this question that I think is on the minds of a lot of us. Following the money is clearly, uh, as Roger said at the outset, uh, one of the things that must be done here. Just to clarify, as as I recall, and I think this is how Roger laid it out too, and uh, General Boykin, I think, is right on the broad outlines of what he said, but uh, some of the particulars. The money that has been flowing to the Chinese Communist Party through thrift savings plan platforms, particularly the International Fund and now this mutual fund window, all began, I, as I understand it, subsequent to President Trump saying, no, we're not going to have these funds go in that direction. Is that correct, Robbie? And uh, how did that come about as best you can reconstruct it? Yeah, no, that's a great question, Frank, and thank you for raising it. A couple of things. I, you're generally correct, but I'll put a finer point on some things and add one clarification. Please. Is that yes, um, you know, there was an intention during the Trump administration to stop the thrift savings plan, the TSP from increasing their China exposure. There also were some key national security events that took place during the administration, including the new national security law that China put in place over Hong Kong. So you basically had multiple um, things transpiring at one time. So there was a desire by BlackRock and those leading the thrift savings plan um, through the fiduciary responsibilities to change the index, which is kind of the index that underlies the I fund of the TSP. What they wanted to do was change it from an index that only had Hong Kong listed companies uh, to an index that had a lot of uh, China companies also in there. And so mind you, these Hong Kong listed companies can be mainland China companies. They're, they're what are called H shares. They're listed on the Hong Kong exchange, but um, they are not necessarily Hong Kong, you know, born and bred businesses. But at any rate, the Trump administration made it clear that this change to this other index was, was not acceptable because it would increase the exposure of the TSP and of the, of the I fund, um, which is the only international fund of the traditional core you know, five funds of the PS of the TSP, 
would increase that exposure to China. Mm -hmm. So that was a problem. But it wasn't necessarily that there was a, a, a total effort to do anything about um, the Hong Kong companies already on offer. So I don't have in front of me the full history of the index that the TSP uses, which is called the MSCI EAFE index or EAFE. Um, that index, you know, has historically held Hong Kong companies for a while and at, at present still does. Um, but I think that what happened during the Trump administration is there was a big effort to prohibit something worse from happening, but not necessarily um, at that point, you know, a keen uh, take on excising anything else, but just to make sure this other really bad thing didn't happen. But at the same time, you know, during the summer of, of 2020, so the last summer of the Trump administration, you know, during the heat of, of COVID, quite frankly, um, and everything else going on in the world and the lockdowns and all going on, China uh, exerted its authorities over Hong Kong and promulgated this national security law. As you recall, you know, there's all the protests and, and the arrest of our, you know, uh, friends like Jimmy Lai, et cetera, the destruction of, you know, Apple, Apple Daily um, and, and, you know, freedom of, of speech and basic you know, rule of law in Hong Kong taking place. And so, you know, you had a fundamental shift then happen in the efficacy and of the rule of law and the trust you could have then, I think, on any transactions and any business dealings then ongoing in and through Hong Kong, because you had basically what was this, you know, one country, two systems model um, dismantled. And the hopes and dreams of the British came kind of crashing down as Hong Kong was sort of handed back over uh, to the mainland, you know, uh, CCP government. And so I think that there's always been, you know, uh, Hong Kong exposure. Um, again, I don't have all the data in front of me to track, you know, what that exposure has looked like. Uh, but right that's now, very helpful. Yeah, right now it's 2.61% of the iFund. Um, and, and, you know, Roger said 32 companies or so. That's our last count there. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's but, been but there. it's China. Today, right. it's exactly. it's not exactly. Hong Kong as though there's some Correct. difference. It's right. China, full on. Yep. So if you are investing as a thrift savings plan participant in the I fund, the international fund, you are compelled to have a portion of your funds invested in communist China. Now, th this brings me to the next question that I wanted to ask of you, and I, I sort of alluded to it earlier. This isn't just somebody else's money. This is members of Congress's retirement fund as well. Uh, Robbie, do we have any idea? Is there any way to know? Or if there isn't, shouldn't we be asking the question of members of Congress? Do you have your retirement funds invested in communist China, Congressman? That's a great question. That question absolutely should be asked. Um, I, I think that a lot of Congress people will say they don't know. You know, they've divested of certain things or they've put their you know investments in a certain trust or something else they have nothing to do with um, because of some of the ethics laws and, and things they have to come, you know, comply with while being members of Congress. Um, but they have the TSP. And I think that question needs to be asked. Um, I still have my TSP from my federal service. Um, and it, it's it's there. Now we cannot figure that out because that information is is private. You know, we're doing good to have a guesstimate on how much money is in the mutual fund window, you know, versus how much is in the traditional funds of the TSP. So it's very hard because this money is considered, you know, uh, PII type of information. You know, it's not publicly available um, and in those account and, you know, details. But I think that's a great question that ought to be asked because we need to raise awareness. And and these are the questions that the members of Congress should be asking their financial planners and their fiduciaries mm -hmm. um, and then taking back also to the TSP. Another aspect of the money that we need to be following, of course, is the money that uh, these Wall Street mavens, the Black Rocks, uh, the State Streets, the Vanguards, the Fidelities, and oh, by the way, the subject of last week's uh, webinar, Sequoia Capital, Neil Shen and his friends, how much money is being applied, especially to members of Congress who are in oversight roles? Uh, whether it's with respect to the TSP or, or more broadly, the financial markets. Um, I don't know if you have any sense of that uh, either, if that's knowable, but um, it, it seems unmistakable that those donations are translating into influence. Uh, the Chinese boast about it, as a matter of fact. I think it was a Dr. D who uh, was telling us about the old friends 
of China on Wall Street who have been reliably, with the notable exception of the Trump years, he said, able to bend the Congress and Washington more generally to Beijing's will. So do you have any sense of uh, the magnitude of these donations and to whom they're going? And if not, is there any way that that can be ascertained? Another great question, Frank. The answer is no, I, I don't have a full sense of it. I think there's huge, huge gaps in our law when it comes to this. You know, you have your basic FEC laws, your campaign, you know, uh, finance laws, et cetera. But there's, I think, a huge lack of knowledge there because I, I, and I'm, I'm not a FEC lawyer. I don't dabble in the political side. Um, I'm a policy person. But from my understanding, you know, there are certain disclosures regarding, um, you know, finances and where, where, where your campaign contributions come from. There's also gaps, and there's ways to shield that money on the on the political side. And I think that needs better work. But then I also think that um, just in the the policy sphere. There's huge gaps. You know, there's there's laws regarding FARA, you know, your Foreign Agent Registration Act. And so if you lobby on behalf of a foreign country or a foreign entity, you have to disclose that through your annual lobbying disclosure and your registration there. But at the same time, you know, that isn't required necessarily of, of think tanks or of nonprofits or of individuals before you go to testify on the Hill before Congress, you know, or of, of law firms. You know, you're taking on certain clients. You're putting out certain papers, you're, you know, um, have multiple competing interests, you know, um, and then you're going to provide advice to, you know, the House Financial Services Committee on what to do about, you know, outbound investment to China. But, oh, yeah, you work for a law firm that is the largest firm that has the most representative work on behalf of Chinese businesses in Washington, D.C. You know, this stuff is not publicly um, easily uh, dis knowable, uh, not easy to find. You know, I think... Um, in terms of, you know, the nonprofits, the think tanks, the, the different policy groups, um, I think all of that, and even consulting firms and, and contractors, you know, you're contracting and consulting for the U.S. government while also contracting and consulting for the Russian government or the Chinese government, you know, there's are huge, I think, um, problems that must be sorted out. I think some overhaul legislation is, is way past overdue here. I know in the House, there are some reform bills in place, I think, regarding foreign uh, agent registrations regarding think tanks and testifying on the Hill. And then in the Senate, I know last Congress, Senator Ernst had a bill, and I think it's back this Congress, um, called the Consult Act. And basically going after, you know, McKenzie and company and these other known offenders who are, you know, consulting uh, both America and our adversary simultaneously. And, and there's issues about, you know, data secrecy, about privacy, about cybersecurity, you know, about all of that. But then there's also just the questions of, of ethics and morality and, you know, whose team are you on and what, in, what are your interests here? Yes. Um, and so I think there's, there's a lot more that needs to be done in, the, in this space in general. And I did want to just ask you a, a question. We've had a very lively um, series of contributions from our audience. We tried to touch on some of the most important questions, but uh, Robbie, was one of them involved an issue that uh, we haven't discussed, but uh, I think the Coalition for a Prosperous America has done some work in, as have we at the Center for Security Policy and the Committee on the Present Danger of China, namely the state level and even local public pension funds and the extent to which the Chinese have gotten their hooks into them, partly because BlackRock and its friends have been managing those pension funds as well. Can you speak to the magnitude of that problem as well? Yeah, briefly, certainly happy to touch on it. We are working um, to try and engage more at the state level. Like you said, you know, you have your teachers' pensions, your, you know, firefighter pension system, your, you know, uh, state government pensions, mm -hmm. universities, oh, and the universities are even worse because you have the endowment issue, those investment issues, as well as the pension system issues. Right. Um, and you also have you know, the commingling of, of federal research dollars through the mm -hmm. National Science Foundation and higher ed money. And I went to a large public university with a lot of grant money. And, and there's a lot of questions there about those grant partnerships. Um, so universities are a treasure trove of opportunity at the state level. Um, but we are working in close partnership with ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, and I'll actually be at their annual meeting um, later this month, um, hosting our first ever working group on this topic Good. of what can the states Excellent. do? Um, you know, there's a role to play here. And, and frankly, for our audience, I'll just say, you know, it's complicated because the federal sanctions policies, right, those don't apply to the states in the same way. Our country is beautifully built on the principles of federalism mm -hmm. and limited government. And so our federal law does not bind our states. 
But at the same time, our states are not experts in national security and what we're talking about. And the states told us, you know, during the, the Cold War, you know, they you, that was handled by Washington. They weren't really involved because Russia wasn't doing, the former Soviet Union, you know, wasn't doing what the Chinese are now. Our economies are far more intertwined than they ever, ever were. The Russians, frankly, wouldn't let us be that intertwined. They were running a more purist, you know, uh, communist system, whereas in China, you have some sort of a weird mercantilist, you know, state controlled fascism at play. And they're manipulating us for all we're worth. And so yes. no longer can we keep this kind of leave the national security stuff, you know, to, to folks in Washington and states can go, you know, idly by doing their, their state things. Mm -hmm. So we have to figure out a way um, to bring the right expertise to the states, to empower states to make the right decisions. And frankly, most elected officials agree with what we've said here. But the problem is that the folks that they have on these boards or appointed to oversee their pension systems or working, you know, in these kind of pro bono part time roles, they're also in the finance industry. They're themselves, right. you know, on boards of financial services institutions. So they're not going to advise mm -hmm. Governor DeSantis or Governor Abbott or Governor Nome or whoever it is to divest from China. Um, right. And so we're going to be working on, you know, the, this way of figuring out the right model policy for the states, the state of Tennessee Good. has a beautiful example. I encourage you guys to look into that. Tennessee hasn't invested in Russia or China in over 10 years, and their returns are outperforming MSCI All Country World and MSCI wow. EAFI indexes. And so wow. I'll leave it leave it there as there's, there's a, a way it can be done. <laughs> we just tip. need to get everyone there. Yeah. And and again, check out uh, NSIC.com as another way to navigate these uh, treacherous waters. Bobby, I want to thank you very much for taking the time today and, and uh, handling so handsomely um, solo these uh, these questions.